Chapter two, the second day of Christmas. Mom, you're acting weird this morning. When my 12-year-old son Asher made this observation at breakfast, I froze. Asher had always been able to read my moods. We were exceptionally close, or at least we used to be, until I got pregnant. Now Asher lived in a perpetual state of humiliation. I knew why, because I'd eavesdropped on a conversation he'd had with his buddies. Several months ago, one of his friends had asked him, is your mother going to be having a baby? And suspecting Asher had nodded. Ooh, his friend said, wrinkling his nose in disgust. My mom says she's the same age as yours and she's a grandma, twice. Your mom's not going to be on the cover of the National Enquirer now, is she? Why, Asher had asked. His friends had exploded into laughter. I can see it all now, one giggled, right next to alien chairs. Recipe for killer meatloaf will be a picture of Asher's mom. Fertility queen seeks world record as oldest mommy. Another chimed in, really Asher? If she'll have one now, maybe she'll just keep at it till she's 80 or 90, maybe 100. She'll be in the, old, the only old folks home with a nursery. Her picture will be in every grocery checkout line in America, maybe the world. The thoughts of our family photo displayed next to fire-breathing cockatiels and possessed teddy bears was too much for our imaginative, shy son. At the time, I chuckled to myself at their brash, youthful snobbery. However, Asher didn't laugh, ever. He was clearly humiliated and his humiliation had escalated since that day. Naturally, this encouraged his pals to taunt him even more. They had elevated teasing to an art form. They picked on Cash Asher constantly, even going so far as to cut related headlines from such magazines to tape on his school locker. Asher didn't want to be embarrassed for his dear mother. He simply wanted to ignore the pregnancy altogether. He would have been happy if I'd have adopted the 19th century custom of confinement. In truth, I wouldn't have minded either, but our 20th century lifestyle wouldn't allow it. I felt bad for ruining Asher's life, but what could I do? Last I heard, all the local time travel agencies were closed for the season. Now here Asher and I were, enjoying a rare breakfast together with the family, and I was about to destroy his life all over again. I had enticed the children to breakfast with crisp bacon, homemade in English scones, and strawberry jam. I cook this kind of breakfast as often as a comet blitz the skies, but today was special. Scott and I had decided the family should eat breakfast together. Then we'd tell the children about the move to Mississippi. Now that Astra had accused me of acting weird, I knew it was time to break the news. So did Scott. He and I exchanged questioning looks over the table. The, the look said, who's going to tell them? We discussed this issue last night and hadn't come to an agreement. Scott thought I should do it, although he gave no good reason except that I was the mother. Naturally, I thought he should do the dirty deed. After all, who had gotten us into this mess? You're right, Asher, I am acting a little odd, I said, finally answering my son's question. I cleared my throat, then went for it. Your dad has something to tell you all. Scott shot me, shot me a dagger. Not another baby, I hope, 10-year-old Claire deadpanned. <laughs> Scott gave a phony laugh. No, it's not a baby, he said. Then without the slightest pause, he blurted out, kids, we're moving. So much for breaking the news gently. It was so quiet I could hear butter melting on the scones. Moving, Jennifer said, crashing her scone down onto the plate. Dad, I cannot move. I'm a cheerleader, you know. I bit my tongue so I wouldn't make a catty remark. However, all other remarks, catty or otherwise, were terminated because the doorbell rang. Clara ran to the door. Jennifer ran to her room. Her life was clearly over. Meanwhile, at the breakfast table, Asher said, we're moving? When? I can't wait. The wheels turned in his head so fast I could almost see them. The teasing would end for Asher. I hope we're going to California, David, our 14-year-old beach bum wannabe said. Not exactly, I smiled. Mom, Dad, come here. Look who's here. Claire's thunderous voice interrupted our conversation. 
Scott and I were both happy to go to the door, as bad as it had been to tell the kids we were moving. It could only get worse when they found out where we were going. Even Asher might have some objections. Besides, there was probably something nice waiting for us at the door. This time of year, lots of people dropped off platefuls of Christmas cookies, gooey homemade caramels, and fruity breads loaded with citron and nuts. We'd gotten an especially large number of goodies this year because Scott was in the bishopric. It was a little early in the day for fudge, but maybe some good-hearted neighbor was bringing warm cinnamon rolls. I waddled to the doorway, eager to greet the bearer of Christmas calories. Unfortunately, there was no calories at the door. Instead, my mother-in-law waited on the doorstep. My heart almost stopped when I saw her. Then, I saw the suitcase planted firmly in her hand, and I hoped my heart would stop. The suitcase could only mean one thing. Van Browning was here to stay. Van Browning had been my mother-in-law for 19 years, and I still hadn't learned to like her. I admired her, respected her, and even loved her, but I didn't like her. Fan was tough as fake fingernails, so strong-willed she demanded to be called Fan, even though her real name was Fanny. She thought Fanny was an inelegant name since it was also the uncouth name for a body part. She was an exemplary woman in every way, an accomplished painter who managed to sell the occasional painting, a skilled investor who understood the stock market as well as anybody on Wall Street, the self-described clean freak and a whiz at homemaking. She excelled at everything except human relationships. Surprise, Fan called. Mom, Scott said to Fan, what are you doing here? Not that we're not happy to see you, I jumped in covering my husband's guffaw. It's just, well, like you said, a surprise. Fan blustered through the doorway and settled herself on the couch after giving Scott and the children a quick hug. She didn't hug me but settled instead for a pat on my stomach. Good heavens, Natalie, you're going to explode if you don't have that baby soon. You're as big as a hippo. I smiled or grimaced, I'm not sure which. So mom, Scott said, what has taken you away from Boise during the holidays, no less? Fan took a big breath and brushed imaginary crumbs off her lap. No good way to say it, I suppose. Scott, I've left your father. What? Scott and I gasped. You heard me, Fanny shrugged. By the way, Natalie dear, do you have anything to drink? I am absolutely parched. We had lots of to drink, everything from eggnog to bottled water. Scott, honey, why don't you get your mother a cup of eggnog? I bet that would hit the spot, wouldn't it, Fan? Scott shuffled off to the kitchen. He knew what a monumental effort it would take for me to move my body to the refrigerator. A little early in the morning for eggnog, Fran, Fran, Fan chirped. Milk and eggs, what could be better for breakfast? Scott poured skim milk eggnog into a big red mug and brought it to his mother along with a warm scone. Fan took a big swig, doing so much without making a milk mustache. Doing so without making a milk mustache. Too much nutmeg, Fan said. I knew it would have been too much of something or not enough. Now that, now what's this about leaving, Dad? Scott said. Surely you can't be serious. I've never been more serious, Fan said, taking a dainty bite from the scone. Our marriage is over. But Mom, you and Dad have been married for almost 50 years. What terrible thing has happened to end such a long marriage? Socks, Fan said. Then she looked at me and said, if you used a smidge of more butter in these scones, they'd be light as a feather. Socks, Scott said, ignoring Fan's commentary on my cooking. As in stockings? Yes, yeah, socks, stockings. I've had it with his dirty socks. I've picked those things up one too many times. I planted my tongue firmly between my front teeth, willing it to remain there so I couldn't say something stupid. But mom, temple marriages don't break up over socks. Van slammed her eggnog mug down and onto the coffee table. Land sake, Scott, it's not the socks. It's what the socks represent. The woman had lost me. What did socks represent anyway? Mom, why don't you start at the beginning and explain the situation to us? It started about a week ago, Fan said. Bud and I had a little tip because he always leaves his dirty socks on the floor. Every night for 44 years, the man has taken off his socks when he watched TV and dropped the filthy things on the floor every blooming night. Scott did the same thing. It was annoying, but hard, hardly a federal crime. 
The way Fan was talking, you'd think poor Bud had assassinated the president. I've asked Bud to put them in the hamper, Fan continued, but he won't do it, even though I've explained to him how much it bothers me. He's showing total disregard for my feelings. The man doesn't care one whit what I think. As Fan spoke, her arms fluttered around her. She reminded me of an angry wasp. This morning, Fan continued, I got up and saw those socks on the floor beside the couch, and something snapped. Bang. I just like a tight rubber band. I threw some clothes in a bag, jumped in the car, and drove down here. Fan paused for a sip of eggnog. You can understand what I mean now, she concluded. It isn't really the dirty socks. It's the meaning behind the socks. Scott nodded, a look of empathy crossing his face. It scared me to think he might actually understand. <clears throat> Fan's nonsense. Mom, don't worry, Scott said. This will blow over. I'm sure you and Dad can work this out. Maybe go to counseling. Counseling over dirty socks. Now I'd heard everything. I'm not so sure, Fan said, resolute. Sure it will, Scott said. Let me call Dad and tell him you're okay. I'm sure he's worried sick. Then you can stay here until you cool down. Feel free to stay as long as you need to. My blood pressure soared. Why didn't Scott offer to drive Fan back to Boise? Or perhaps suggest that he pay for a motel room? Anything but invite her to live with us, I knew Fan would take Scott up on his generous offer. I also knew Fan could hold a grudge longer than any person I knew. With my luck, the woman would move to Mississippi with us. I open my mouth to temper Scott's offer, maybe downplay it with some vapid comment like, I'm sure you'll want to be back in Boise by Christmas, or I know in a day or two you'll feel like your old self. Unfortunately, Fan opened her mouth first. Oh, Scotty boy, what a lovely offer. I'd love to stay at your house, actually. I knew you'd want me to stay. That's why I brought my suitcase. I'm sure Natalie wouldn't mind having a little help getting ready for Christmas, Scott said, especially with the baby coming and all. I tried to smile. I really did. Instead, I threw up. I didn't mean to. It was just my daily bout of morning sickness, the same miserable morning sickness that had plagued every single day of my pregnancy. Usually I knew it was coming, but today it just happened without any warning. Oh dear, Fran, Fan shrieked, jumping off the couch like she'd been bitten by a king cobra. She's sick. Oh my, oh my land, call the doctor. Scott scrambled to clean up my, the mess. I scrambled away to change my t-shirt. Now it's okay, Scott explained to Fan. It's just morning sickness. Morning sickness, Fan said. Her face alternated between shock, abhorrence, and a big question mark as if she couldn't remember exactly what morning sickness was. Well, that settles it, Fan said. If she's still having morning sickness this far into pregnancy, she needs my help. I am staying. She sidestepped the wet spot on the carpet and sat again on the couch, pausing to pat my stomach as I trundled back into the room. I can't believe you're still having morning sickness, Fan said. Maybe that's why you're so big, dear. Maybe something's wrong. Could the baby be deformed? You know, a little gal in my ward just had a baby and the baby had no brain. No brain at all. Poor little thing. I think it's because the mother took diet drugs before she got pregnant. But isn't that the most awful thing? Have you checked with your doctor, Natalie? Is, there, is something wrong? I'm fine, Fan, I stated flatly. The baby's fine. Morning sickness is a normal part of pregnancy. Everything's fine. My confidence was false, bravado. I'd only, I'd been terrified since day one of the pregnancy, worried about every bizarre anomaly imaginable, fretting about imagined complications and studying st statistical charts about my chances for a healthy baby, but I certainly wouldn't admit that any of that to Fan. Well, that's good news, Fan said. You've had the tests, huh? I bet they hurt. The needles they use for those? Oh, what do they call them? Amnio sounds? Those needles are so long, and I hear they cause miscarriages. Have you checked with your doctor about that? I smiled. I absolutely refuse to discuss such things with Fan. I would not tell her that she was talking about an amniocentesis. I would not tell her that I had opted not to have one. I would not tell her anything. I couldn't. I was too stunned to speak, appalled that Fan was moving in. Nothing would change her mind. Fan was the epitome of stubborn. Fan Browning was here to stay. I shouldn't have been surprised. Fan would fit right into this Christmas of disasters. 
I'd been hoping for Dickinsonian Christmas spirits to appear. I just hadn't expected Fan to be one of them. Her presence accomplished one purpose, however. Suddenly, Dirt Gulch, Mississippi didn't seem like such a bad place to live. It was over a thousand miles away from Boise.